Hello everyone and welcome back to my kitchen. My name is Colleen and today I want to share with you the basics of water bath canning. I, I'm quite comfortable working with both water bath and pressure canning, um, but for some of you that haven't gotten started canning yet, this might be the season to start looking at the, the things that you need in order to be ready, um, even in a really small way, to be ready for this gardening season. We have just planted our gardens here in British Columbia where I live and uh, then we had a huge rainstorm and everything's popping up and that makes the heart happy for sure to see that everything that um, that we've planted is is gaining ground and we will have a plentiful harvest for sure. I also purchase because our garden space is small so I also purchase from the farmers market and I am happy to uh, accept the overburden that other people have and I'm happy to pay for that even um, if they give it to me that's wonderful too I always make sure I give something back but um, it, it is that season so it gives you some time to collect the things you need and be ready when the harvests are ready so today we're going to water bath can and I'm going to go through the items that you need to be a successful water bath canner. So I will gather some things up. I've got enough to fill my counter for sure. And I will be back right after this. I definitely have a lot of stuff out here and don't be don't be intimidated by everything that's here. Not everything that's here is going to be on your counter or on your table when you're preparing to water bath can. It's just, I've gathered a lot of things and I'm actually gonna go through the process of canning some tomatoes today so that you can see that process um, from beginning to end. So, the very first thing you need um, to be a, a any kind of a successful canner is some books and you could check these out of the public library I think um, in most places they have good canning books and canning sections uh, all, all over the country I have the Bernardin complete book of home preserves and it has served me pretty well although I do use a lot of the old recipes that my mom used and my grandmother before and I'm not afraid to venture into some of the old canning books and old canning methods. Um, I'm not talking to you today about the old canning methods because I don't want you to be confused by a lot of different um, methods of canning. Today we're just going to try and concentrate on water bath canning and doing it according to the rules that exist at the moment. They are ever-changing, so uh, books, this one here I think was from 1943, and the methods in have changed a lot since then, although that doesn't bother me. There are, I, I guess in some instances I would be considered a rebel canner because I'm not afraid to use these old-fashioned methods, but for beginners I would recommend, this is Bernardin is the ball company in Canada so if you're in the US look for the ball book or any good canning book and uh, this would be my first purchase you can look for these online and use bookshops um, yeah almost everywhere I bought this one online I think through Amazon and uh, but there are lots of ways to get them even consider uh, your friends who have uh, maybe our canners and if they have a ball book flip ask them if it's okay to flip through and copy down the recipes because you're I have not used not one-third of the recipes in this book so copy down the ones that um, are meaningful to you that you would actually can in your home and then once you've got your feet wet so to speak then you'll be ready maybe 
to or in a position to buy the book for yourself and branch out and try some of the other uh, recipes that are in the book so step one have a good book or a good recipe to go by and understand what um, that means when you're looking through this book there's a good guide in here to talk to you about elevations for canning if you are canning with pressure today we're not going to do that we're just doing water bath methods so um, but i want you to know that that's there if you're already advanced enough to head into the pressure canning but i would recommend baby steps and start with water bath canning what can be water bath canned um, most fruit and berries can be water bath canned and also pickles anything that's um, you raise the acidity level because that's the key to water bath canning now you can uh, follow a set recipe if you're making jams or jellies and you're using some sort of fruit pectin most of them tell you to add lemon juice or in the case of pickles vinegar to the water which brings up the acidity level and then there's less chance of you having any kind of um, botulism or other scary things in your your fruits and vegetables i have never had an issue with anything that i've canned but i'm and i don't know anybody that's ever had an issue but maybe it's because we basically we follow a lot of rules other things that you're going to need when you get started are a good canner. Now, when you're first starting out, that can be just like a stock pot or a large pot that you can put the jar in and you have two inches of space over top of the top of the jar for the water to boil so that the entire jar is being heated all around. There also has to be a barrier between the bottom of the jar and the bottom of the pot. Now, you can use just a series of rings in the bottom of the pot and that creates an, a barrier underneath so that the jars are being evenly heated and that, that works really well or you could just use a kitchen towel you just need a little barrier because what happens when the glass touches the bottom of the can or when the water starts to boil because the the burner is right there against the bottom of the metal the Water starts to boil underneath the jar. Yeah, they do that. And they once they get boiling like that, then they tend to move back and forth and they clang together and you can get breakage that way. So also, if you're that close to the bottom of the pot and the burner is on high, you can actually scorch the food product in the bottom of the jar and you don't want to do that either. So a good pot, it needs to have a lid and you you can use a pizza pan to put on the top of it to bring it to a boil or whatever you have that um, would work to help create you know a good good rolling boil inside your pot so i'm just going to move this is my canner and i purchased it a couple of years ago after i finally i think i had that canning pot maybe 40 years i don't know a long time it finally was a piece of the enamel came off the bottom of the pot and a hole went through so my husband said for heaven's sakes get yourself a good canning pot so I bought this particular one and the one thing that I really like about it is that it doesn't have the separators in here um, like the old canning pots do so I can literally fill this right full and I don't have to worry that I'm in between the bars because a lot of the canning pots have um, little dividers that are, keep their jars separated from each other. So I like that about this canning pot. And it will hold eight jars and it uh, works really well. So a canning pot. I'm gonna set this aside so that uh, we can look at some of the other things. Now, there's some tools you, that make it easier for you. One of them is this um, jar lifter. And this one has, you know, automatic return. I don't know what you call it, but it must have a spring in there that brings it back. These are handy because you don't want to be lifting the hot jars out of the canning kettle with a cloth. It's just way too hot. If you uh, invest in anything, invest in a good jar lifter. 
these jar lifters can be found at thrift stores, um, most hardware stores that sell canning supplies. They can be found at Walmart. They can come in a kit with, with other pieces. So it could come with a funnel and a magnetic lid lifter and a debubbler. And I think that's the most common way they come in a kit. You don't necessarily need all of that stuff. I've been canning a long time and I kind of do bare bones because <laughs> I don't know about you, but I have drawers full of gadgets and goo that I just don't have room for more. So I try to keep it as simple as possible. And I, these are my basic tools. I use my jar lifter, my funnel, and I have a couple of them. One of them I bought at, um, at a thrift store, so it's not one of the old enamel ones. I don't use it much, I use this plastic one more. Um, I, I definitely use my uh, soup ladle, and then I use just a plain old wooden skewer to debubble my jars, and this works great. I, I think that's about all of those things that you need. Next, let's talk about jars. So, I have all different kinds of jars here, and different sizes. So, this is a quart jar, and this is uh, three quarters of a quart, or here in Canada, it's 750 milliliters. This is a pint, which is also two cups. This is a half pint, which is one cup. And then there is the uh, quarter pint, which just, I think it's just for four ounces. And um, these little fellas, I have a specific use for them. I don't use them for canning, I use them for freezing because we grow our own basil and we make our own pesto. And if I uh, fill this to the, um, oh, it's about the half inch mark on the, on the lid here, on the neck of the jar and I put the top on and I put it into my freezer. They freeze and actually a couple of weeks ago we used the last jar from last year. So uh, we're definitely looking forward to growing some more this year and getting um, our freezer stocked up again. These little jars don't take up any room in the freezer. So um, perfect for that. These pint, half pint jars are, are good for jams and jellies. And if you're a couple, that um, doesn't eat much for jams and jellies, then these little four ounce ones would be perfect for that. Um, just be mindful that it would probably take you 15 of these little half pint, no, quarter pint jars um, in order to make a batch of jam or jelly. So it's always good when you're starting to um, make sure that your jars are free from any cracks or um, don't have any chips around the rim and give them an inspection. And this is a good practice each and every year is to make sure, or when you're putting your jars away to make sure that um, they are still in good shape and you have nothing to worry about. Jars have gotten quite dear in price. And I think here in Canada, uh, 12, of these uh, quart jars are, are going to cost you around $20 and they will come with a set of seals or lids and a set of rings. So you're going to replace the seals every time but not the rings so you can have the rings for a really long time. If you can find these jars at thrift stores, garage sales, um, definitely do that. But also realize that um, a jar, a good jar is a good jar. They don't depreciate in value at all. So I, if I saw jars at a garage sale, I would not be afraid to pay a dollar a jar for them because they, you will have them for years and years and years to come. So um, it's, it's a really important investment. You can get away with using a pot that isn't a canner, but you cannot get away using a jar that, that's not suited for the purpose. So definitely uh, keep your eyes open. You don't have to start canning with everything um, fresh out of the store. You can definitely be canning with 
things that you gather up. There, you may know some older people who may have canned previously and they just haven't thought about getting rid of their canning stuff and maybe inquire, you know, did you have any canning stuff? Would you be interested in getting rid of it? Because, you know, I want to get into doing some canning and they, they are a good resource because if they were canners, they are going to have hundreds of jars and they will have canners and all the equipment that you need. It may not be all the equipment that makes your kitchen fancy, but you'll, they'll have everything that you need. So, moving on from the jars, you need to have good rings. And um, these rings all came with my jars. And I haven't bought any rings in a long time, but you can buy the rings in kits. This, this isn't one, but you can buy them in kits. They come in a, in a box like this and they have a ring and a seal and, a, and there's tw would be probably 12 of them in a box. And so that gives you an opportunity to build up your rings. But um, if you're a regular canner and you're using your food on a regular basis out of your pantry, then you will already have a good supply of rings that you can count on. So, the next thing that you're going to need to can is um, some good seals or lids. And I work with four jars and I have found these to be um, exceptional. Um, they are definitely something a company that I'm happy to work with. They stand behind their product. They are BPA free and the, the, um, just the thickness of them. It pleases me. It seems in recent years a lot of the companies have tried to make their product thinner. There's probably a reason for that. It could be a metal shortage. It could be that um, there. It could be that the metal is expensive. I'm not sure what their reasoning behind it is, but um, these ones seem to be thicker. I have used hundreds of them now, and I am having no issue at all with these. Um, with these and I feel confident to recommend them to you so you need these good seals and they come in big sleeves and this box had a hundred in it and you can buy them that way or or smaller amounts or bigger amounts I think four jars now has them for sale by the thousands but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure about that but I will definitely uh, leave the information about four jars and the link in the description box below and you should be aware that if you purchase through my link below you'll get 10 percent off your lids when you check out and um, a little bit of that comes to me not a terrific amount but a little bit and every little bit helps in this day and age so i'm just going to move some of these things out of the way move around so that we can get started um, putting these tomatoes into jars. Now I'm a bit of an old-fashioned canner so I still heat my lids although the company says you don't have to do that I'm, I'm going to heat them up. I feel like the seal gets a little softer and makes for a better uh, seal. The company does recommend that you wash your lids first and that makes good sense to me. Um, I'm going to just put these on the stove and get them set at a simmer. They don't have to be boiling, but I want to get them warm. Now I have some tomatoes here that I want to get into jars. And so I'm going to use my funnel, which is a very handy tool, just for clarity. It doesn't mean I won't get <laughs> tomatoes juice all over the rim. I probably will, but it definitely does help when I'm trying to get the uh, fruit into the jar too, because uh, there's no way that I would do a tidy job of this if I didn't have this funnel. They're pretty fantastic. I'm working with whole tomatoes today, and these tomatoes have already been canned, so I... Um, do not need to uh, worry about their acidity level and I'm just recanning them for the purposes of this video so that you can see the process. Follow me along 
um, step by step, just so that you can see the ease with which you can can uh, water bath can things. Tomatoes are considered a, a fruit, and therefore we can can them in the water bath canner. When I'm canning fresh tomatoes, I always add some lemon juice to the uh, mix just to bring up the acidity level a little bit. I know lots of canners that don't do that. They just um, work with the, the product that they have and trust that the acidity level in the tomatoes that they're canning is high enough. A half an inch of headspace in these jars. Now when I talk about headspace, I'm talking about the distance from the shoulder of this jar, so right, right here at the shoulder, to the top of the lid, to the top of, sorry, to the top of the jar. And you can, as one of the kits comes with a debub debubbler that has measurements on it. So if you're not confident in looking at it and saying that's one inch, then you should get out your measuring tape. You don't need, again, you don't need that special tool. Get out a measuring tape and measure it. But generally speaking, that is the one inch mark and the half inch is just halfway up from there. So when you're doing jams and jellies, you're going to leave only a, a quarter inch headspace. That's all that's required. And it, uh, if you follow those rules along, that'll work out really well for you. So I am just checking these to make sure I'm getting equal amounts of tomatoes in every jar. And I might have to do something about that one. So now I'm going to get a spoon and scoop that out of there. Because these have been pre-cooked I might be able to just take out what I need and not the whole tomato. Okay, I'll take out the whole tomato and I'll cut it in half and I will put it back into the jar. Now as you can see I'm making quite a mess. It just seems to be my kitchen. Now I have filled all the jars and I made a mess down the side of a few of them so I'm just going to use my kitchen dish rag and I'm going to wipe these off just the outside of the jars I'm not wiping the rims with this um, because I'm going to clean the rims separately with some vinegar And there, that'll do it. Now, the last place that these jars can fail is right here at this step. Because if we fail to clean the, the uh, top of the jar off, um, there may be a food, food particle stuck there. Or if you're cooking with um, anything that has butter in it or grease, although butter is not recommended, people do it, um, then you definitely want to go around. I'm just using a bit of white vinegar on a kitchen towel. You don't, again, don't need anything fancy here. And I am just going to clean the top of the jar off. And if I see I have food product on it, I'm just going to turn that over and get a clean surface again and continue on we want to give these jars every reason to succeed and um, we can do that by just a little with just a little bit of care it doesn't take long to run around your jars and make sure that you wipe them all down now these are cold packed that means and, and because i'm recanning these i can do that um, but what a cold pack means is that you start with a cold canner, you start with cool, cold or raw food in the jar, your jars have been sterilized but allowed to cool, 
and everything is cool. If you are hot packing, which you most certainly can do, you just do, just consider that. It's a hot pack, so you want to start with hot jars, hot water in your canner that's the same temperature as the food in the jars, and start your canner um, from that point on. When your canner reaches a full rolling boil, that's the time that you um, count out the number of minutes that your recipe said you need to cook that for, but it needs to come to a full rolling boil where the water in the canner is boiling at least two inches above the, at least an inch, um, if they're going for a short time. But if you're water bath canning for 45 minutes, you need at least two inches of water over top of the jars. More water is better than less water. So I'm just going to reach the, uh, the lids and get them on. And they are literally just warm. I think I, oh yeah, I can still put my hand in there. And I'll put these on. And these, ooh, yellow, warm. And that didn't take long. Most of my rings are in pretty good condition, but um, some of them are getting a little rusty. I still use them. It just means you have to be cautious when you're screwing them down because they might um, jam up a little bit and you might not get as good a seal as you think you're getting. So they go on. Most canners just go fingertip tight. I go a little more than that. Um, that's entirely up to you. They do that so that they don't have lids that buckle. I've never had lids that buckle, so I, that doesn't concern me. And I am um, pleased with the, as I said, I've done it and <laughs> it's worked for me, so I'm not going to change it up because I see far too many people having failures and um, I feel like if it's not broke, don't fix it. So I have those jars ready and I realize that six jars won't fill my canner. It holds eight. So I have also filled two jars, two pint jars, because I didn't want to be higher than those ones, with plain tap water. And in Golden, where I live, our tap water is exceptional. It is untreated milk. But Canner to, for, for a canner to, to work really well, it needs to be fully loaded. And this is especially true if you're going to be pressure canning because they're tested with the canners full. Uh, water bath canning it isn't so important, but what is important is that the jars, when, they, when the water is boiling, don't, don't bang around inside the canner. So if you load it full, then you won't have that issue. I put in water, I use used seals, and just put the rings on. Now, if these happen to actually uh, can, if, if the seal is good and firm, I always have some canned water in the cupboard. It, uh, it's a good thing to have just for safety's sake, and um, I don't necessarily use my good jars for that, but um, it, it is, a, a good way to have um, safe drinking water uh, stuck away in your pantry. Otherwise, if you don't need it, you can just dump it out, put your jars away, and use them for something else. So now I'm going to take these over and get them into the canner, which I have on the stove, and we'll get that turned on. So I've just loaded the bottles into my canner, and I'm just going to lower it into the water that I've already put in there. and. I noticed that it's just to the top of the rings, just about to come over, but that's not enough water. So I'm going to use my kettle. I have cool water in it. I'm just transferring the water. And I am going to make sure that these jars are covered by at least an inch of water. And I'd say so. <laughs> I'd say that's an inch. For safety's sake, I'm going to add a little more water and then I'm going to turn on the stove and we'll get these to a full rolling boil. Now I just wanted to show you, this is probably going to be really loud, but I wanted to show you what I was talking about. This is a full rolling boil. 
And I also should mention at this time that I added about two tablespoons of vinegar, white vinegar to the water because we have hard water here and it tends to leave uh, the, a deposit, a mineral deposit on the outside of the jars. So this is a full rolling boil. My timer is going and I will see you back here in 30 minutes. And here we are, 25, no, 30 minutes later. I have canned up these wonderful um, plum tomatoes and I think that I've covered almost every step that you need to know uh, about canning, water bath canning for beginners. The only thing that I would say is that I don't think I was clear about my skewer, that I use the skewer inside the jar and I force it down all the way around the outside edge and into the middle a few times to make sure there's no air trapped in, inside the jar anywhere. That all of the bubbles, that if there are big bubbles inside the jar, you use the skewer to bring the bubble up to the top. Because inside the bubble, there may be uh, botulism or some other organism that stays alive inside the bubble that's not getting uh, the full temperature because it's insulated inside that bubble. So that's what we use the, this for. I don't think I showed you that step. Uh, I did it, but I don't think I showed it to you. I've had my camera cut out and cut on about uh, eight times today, which is a bit frustrating. Um, but I think that I still managed to capture everything that you need to know to get started with water bath canning. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have, just put them in the comment section below and I will uh, do my best to answer every single one of them. So until next time folks, I hope that you're all well and safe and I will see you again soon. Take care everybody. Bye bye.